G'day, g'day. How you going? Why do you know? Well, light a bong. Just say g'day. And how you go when just say g'day, g'day, g'day. That's the Aussie way. Just say g'day, 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 and light a bong. Hey, g'day legends. We're going to listen to some um, Cheech and Chong. Goes for about, I don't know, half an hour or something. If you want to hang out, we'll have a couple of songs, kick back, wishing you well, peace. This is going to be good. It's AI generated. It's not mine. Fair use. Cheers, mates. Let's roll. Big love, mates. Don't need no dealer to keep you waiting around. Don't need no desperate late night road trip to the seedy side of town. Don't need no friend of a friend whose cousin knows a guy. Don't need to worry and bread and panty before you can finally get high. Cause boy, if you don't got that card, you won't get very far Cause you got the medical marijuana blue You say doctor Help me please Got a headache, I'm tired and stressed out And I can't get back to sleep You say doctor Help me please I'm hearing voices I'm seeing things and I need me a remedy. But boy, if you don't got that card, you won't get very far. Cause you got the medical marijuana flu. How blind you got a doctor? Oh yeah, man, I got all kinds of doctors. Oh yeah? You just need money, you get any doctor you want to. What's a good doctor? Uh, I got Dr. Dre, you know Dr. Oh, Dre? Uh -huh. Yeah, he, he got some good stuff, man. Oh, he'll yeah. make you feel good. Oh, yeah. Well. And Dr. Phil? Dr. Phil? Yeah, he'll get you all the pills you need. Oh, what about Dr. Conrad Murray? Oh, Dr. Oh, that guy? Oh, man, stay away from that dude, man. He can't tell time where he shit, man. Oh, okay. No, I wouldn't go near that dude. Oh, well, what no. was it, Dr. Dre? Yeah, Dr. Dre, yeah. yeah. You can't hang with him, man. Say, doctor. Doctor. Help me, please. I got acid reflux and my feet hurt, and it's painful when I pee. You say, doctor, help me, please. I'm a bipolar, impotent, paranoid wreck, and my friends think I'm a freak. But boy, if you don't get that card, you won't get very far. You got the medical marijuana. Just me, man. Hey, hey, help me out here. Uh, I, I made up my own card. You know, I want you to tell me if it's all right. Take a look at it. Is that right? Is you? That's, that's a white man on this card. Yeah, well, that's okay. Yeah, I'm blind. I, they don't know the difference. You say Juan Lopez. But boy, if you don't want that card, you won't get very far. You got the medical marijuana blue. Alright legends, grab your belly, roll a joint, get comfortable, kick back, relax, we'll drop a song in between it, this will go for roughly, oh, I don't know, half an hour or something, I'll play a few tunes, wishing you well, peace, let's roll. Humor, Cheech and Chong started a cultural uprising that challenged societal criteria and brought underground comedy to the mainstream. But beyond the cloud of marijuana smoke and the mist of laughter lies a tale as interesting as it is surprising. Who were the real Cheech and Chong beyond their on-screen persona? And what drove them to push the boundaries of comedy and culture with such courage and disrespect? Join us as we delve deep into the untold truths of Cheech and Chong, the duo's early journey.
Richard Anthony Cheech Marin entered the world on a warm July 13th in 1946, in the vibrant neighborhood of South Central Los Angeles. His father, Oscar, served as a dedicated officer in the LAPD, while his mother, Elsa, juggled the demands of her job as a secretary. It was from an amusing remark by his uncle that the nickname Cheech was bestowed upon him, a playful comparison to a crunchy Spanish delicacy, the chicharron, due to his appearance as a baby. As a youngster, Marin's family relocated to the peaceful suburb of Granada Hills, where he spent his constructive years and attended a local Catholic high school. Despite excelling academically with top grades, Cheech was known for his playful tricks, often finding himself in trouble for his witty sense of humor. Beyond his academic pursuits, Marin harbored a deep love for music, spending countless hours jamming with friends in various bands. Yet, it was during his time at California State University in Northridge that his life took a colorful turn. It was there, between the busy campus life, that he had his first encounter with marijuana. With one inhale, Cheech found himself transported into a new realm, questioning the truths he had been taught about the substance by adults. This sparked an interest in him, pondering the authenticity of other teachings he had received. Furthermore, Marin's college years were marked by his active involvement in movements against war and draft resistance. He embraced these causes passionately, adding layers to his already complex persona. Cheech Marine's journey from the lively streets of South Central to the halls of academia was not just one of personal discovery, but also societal awakening, shaping the man he would become. His partner Thomas Chong, on the other hand, was born on May 24, 1938, and unlike Cheech, he had a life filled with unexpected twists and turns. His father, Stanley, hailed from China and worked as a truck driver, while his mother, Lorna Jean, was a Canadian waitress. Growing up in Calgary, Alberta, Thomas experienced the harsh realities of racism due to his mixed heritage. Despite the challenges, Thomas found solace in pottery, guided by his dedicated teacher. When the weight of the draft hung over him, Thomas made a daring escape to Canada with the help of his pottery mentor, avoiding imprisonment. There, he immersed himself in the craft, becoming an apprentice to a renowned potter. Seeking refuge from the confusion of the world, Thomas embraced a rustic lifestyle, settling in a cozy log cabin nestled deep within the Canadian wilderness. Surrounded by nature's embrace, he found peace and fulfillment. Reflecting on his tumultuous childhood, Thomas shared poignant memories in a 2020 interview with The Guardian. He recounted moments of exclusion and discrimination, like being left out of a friend's birthday party because of his race. Thomas vividly recalled peering out of a second-story window, watching his friends gather around a fire, while he remained outside, unwelcome because of outdated prejudices. When Chong was just 16, he decided to leave school to focus on his passion for music. He was good at playing the guitar, and soon enough he got an opportunity to join a cool band called The Shades, which was made up of people from different races, and was all about soulful music. Later on, they changed their name to Little Daddy and the Bachelors, and moved to Vancouver, where they put out a song and started to gather fans bit by bit. Their big break came when they transformed into Bobby Taylor and the Vancouvers. Thanks to a recommendation from Diana Ross and her group, The Supremes, they caught the attention of Barry Gordy, the big shot in the music industry. Motown, the famous record label, signed them up. They made a hit song called, Does Your Mama Know About Me, with Bobby Taylor. This song was really special because it was about a couple from different backgrounds, and it touched a lot of people's hearts. It even made it onto the top 40 list on the Billboard Hot 100 and soared high on the Rhythm and Blues charts, reaching the top five. The Birth of Cheech and Chong When Cheech crossed paths with Chong, it began an unexpected journey. Chong had recently been let go from his band, leaving him with a $5,000 check as a farewell gesture. He decided to return to Vancouver, his hometown. During his travels, Chong discovered that his parents had transformed one of his former hangouts into the Shanghai Junk, Vancouver's pioneering topless club. This fortunate turn of events intrigued him. Chong had a background in music, having been part of Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's, but he had also been exposed to the world of comedy through Chicago's Second City. 
This exposure reignited his passion for improvement, and he saw the Shanghai junk as the perfect stage to experiment and refine his skills. With a vision in mind, Chong assembled a unique team consisting of topless dancers, a mime, and a classical guitarist. Together, they aimed to transform burlesque entertainment for the era of hippies and counterculture. Meanwhile, Cheech had made his way to Vancouver, carving out a niche for himself as a part-time writer for a local music magazine. His editor sensed potential in Cheech and recommended that he meet Chong, sensing an interesting story in the making. Despite their unconventional backgrounds, Cheech and Chong hit it off immediately. Recognizing Cheech's talent, Chong invited him to join their creative endeavors and thus began the iconic partnership that would define their careers. Their legendary comedy act was born out of happenstance when Chong's new musical venture was scheduled to perform for the first time. To start things off with a bang, Cheech and Chong took the stage to share some jokes and get the audience warmed up. Their humor was so funny that people couldn't stop laughing, and each joke seemed to top the last one, keeping everyone in stitches. Their comedy routine went on for so long that there wasn't any time left for the band to perform. Cheech and Chong always approached comedy like music, with its rhythm and beat. They knew exactly when to deliver a punchline and when to pause for maximum impact. Feeling pumped up from their successful performance, Cheech and Chong decided to try their luck in Los Angeles, the hub of comedy. They scored a spot at an open mic night, but money was tight, and they ended up moving in with Chong's wife as their living situation had already become extremely difficult. Things took a turn for the worse when Chong's nightclubs in Vancouver started losing money and had to close down. With their finances in jeopardy, Cheech and Chong had to hustle, performing at various clubs across Southern California just to make ends meet. After a performance that went wrong, they realized they weren't clicking with their audience. So they decided to dig into the vibes of the peace, love, and freedom era to find inspiration for their characters, Pedro and Man. Their new act hit the jackpot with the crowd almost immediately. The charming duo of laid-back stoners became a massive hit in the comedy scene, leading to packed venues, better gigs, and eventually catching the attention of music producer Lou Adler. With just $2,000, a simple tape recorder, and a space for rehearsals at Alfred's and Moss's records, Cheech and Chong started piecing together what would become a legendary comedy record. Their debut album, released in August 1971, was an instant hit with both critics and fans, climbing up to number 28 on the Billboard charts. Their humor, perfect timing, and spot-on characterizations shone through in their comedy masterpiece. It garnered them not only success, but also the first of six Grammy nominations for Best Comedy Recording, The Unconventional Rise. In 1978, the comedic duo Cheech and Chong aimed to conquer the world of movies with their debut feature film, Up in Smoke. Originally, they planned to gather the funniest bits from their albums and live performances. However, they shifted their focus to their beloved characters, Pedro and Man. Explaining this decision, Cheech Marine explained to Rolling Stone that they wanted to showcase a day in the life of Pedro and Man, finding their everyday antics more interesting than a traditional plot. Marines summarized the essence of the movie as follows. Two guys meet, and they decide to form a band together, but first they need a joint. This simple premise laid the foundation for the film's storyline. The creation process was spontaneous and unconventional. Instead of a formal script, Tommy Chong described their approach as having a loose roadmap scribbled on a yellow legal pad. Under the guidance of director Lou Adler, Cheech and Chong were given the freedom to explore and experiment. This improvisational style added a layer of authenticity and humor to Up in Smoke, making it a unique and memorable cinematic experience. Chong praises Adler's flexibility, noting that whenever they wanted to change something during filming, Adler was always open to it. However, despite their smooth collaboration, bringing Up in Smoke to the big screen wasn't without its challenges. According to reports from Variety, Paramount's president, Michael Eisner, initially halted the production after watching an early version of the film. Undeterred, director and producer Lou Adler decided to take matters into his own hands. He purchased the rights to the film back from Paramount, financing its completion with his funds. 
After conducting test screenings and observing the audience's enthusiastic response, Eisner reconsidered his decision, and Paramount reacquired the film. Despite its modest budget of just under $2 million, Up in Smoke turned out to be a massive success, raking in a remarkable $20 million within its first month of release. After the success of Up in Smoke, Cheech and Chong continued their comedic journey with two more films, Cheech and Chong's Next Movie in 1980 and Nice Dreams in 1981. These movies, while still packed with their trademark drug-related humor, didn't quite reach the same level of acclaim as their debut, but they still brought plenty of laughs and made good money despite their modest budgets. Their next venture, Things Are Tough All Over, released in 1982, showed a slight departure from their usual antics, focusing more on storytelling rather than just gags about marijuana. Then, in the following year, they came back with Still Smokin', a movie that blended various sketches and footage from their live shows, all set against the backdrop of an adventure at a film festival in Amsterdam. While critics may not have been impressed with Still Smokin', loyal fans continued to support Cheech and Chong's irreverent and sometimes crude humor. Despite the mixed reviews, their comedic chemistry and knack for outrageous situations kept audiences entertained. But when Cheech and Chong unveiled their latest venture, it was like nothing their fans had ever seen before. The duo, known for their comedic antics, took a daring leap into uncharted territory with The Corsican Brothers in 1984. This movie was a comedic twist on Alexandre Dumas's timeless tale about brothers who share a unique connection, feeling each other's pains. Critics, who had often been unimpressed by their previous works, didn't hold back their doubt this time either. Despite the anticipation, the movie failed to spark much interest, even among die-hard Cheech and Chong followers. The Corsican brothers struggled to recoup even a fraction of its hefty $10 million production budget. Sadly, this misstep marked the end of Cheech and Chong's cinematic journey, leaving audiences and industry insiders alike puzzled over what went wrong. The Split and Success Story in 1985, the famous comedy duo Cheech and Chong put out their album and home video named Get Out of My Room. This marked the end of their collaboration as they parted ways bitterly. Their friendship, which had lasted almost 20 years, turned sour due to their egos and differences in creative visions. Despite their disagreements, they managed to continue working together without letting their animosity affect their professional relationship. However, as time went on, the tension between them became unbearable. Cheech, during a talk with Talks at Google in 2017, mentioned the constant clashes between him and Tommy, attributing it to their strong personalities. He described their conflicts as the friction that eventually led to their creative output. According to Cheech, the breaking point came when Chong's ego began to overshadow their collaboration. As their fame grew, Chong desired more control, wanting to take on roles like director and soul writer. This shift in dynamics strained their partnership further. The final blow to their collaboration came when Chong refused to participate in recording the song Born in East Los Angeles. Let's roll a bit of Born in East LA, shall we? We'll break it up a bit. Cheers, mates. Thanks for hanging out. You're a legend. you can. Where were you born, man? Huh? Where was I born? That's right. I said, where were you born? Hey, are you one of those dudes that do horoscopes, man? Hey, I'm a cancer with a bad moon rising. Look here, Alfago. Watch my lips. Where were you born? I was born in East LA, man. I was born in East LA. Oh, yeah. You're born in East LA. Well, 
let's see your green card, huh? Green card? I'm from East LA. All right, well then who's president of the United States? Oh, that's easy, man. That guy that used to be on Death Valley days, uh, John Wayne. All right, let's go. Come on. leaving Cheech disheartened and ultimately leading to their split. Many years after their split, a more modest Tommy Chong now acknowledges his former partner's view of their separation. Speaking on the radio in 2020, he confessed, I felt deeply wounded, although I realize now that I may have been the cause of our breakup. You see, I became a bit arrogant when it came to our movies because I took on the role of director. As a director, your decisions carry a lot of weight and it's difficult to let go of that power. Reflecting on the past, he added, when my partner first decided to pursue his path, I felt a profound sense of betrayal. The song Born in East Los Angeles took a playful jab at Bruce Springsteen's Born in the United States of America. It was mistakenly credited to both Cheech and Chong, but in reality, it was Cheech's solo effort. Surprisingly, it became a massive hit. This success caught the attention of Universal executive Frank Price, who saw potential in Cheech's talent. He suggested turning the song's theme of a Mexican-American man facing comical mishaps after being wrongly deported into a full-fledged comedy movie. 
Cheech seized the opportunity with excitement. He took on the roles of writer, director, and star in what would become his first major project without Tommy Chong. The movie, released in 1987 called Born in East Los Angeles, marked Cheech's emergence as a standalone creative force. With his newfound freedom, Cheech showcased his skill for portraying diverse characters through different accents and dialects. This led to numerous opportunities, including voice acting gigs in popular films such as Oliver and Company and The Lion King. Cheech's journey from a parody song to a successful comedy film not only established him as a solo artist, but also opened doors to a flourishing career in the entertainment industry. In 1996, Cheech displayed his comedic talent in a different light with his role in the romantic comedy film Tin Cup. This movie allowed him to showcase a more nuanced aspect of his humor. As the late 90s approached, Cheech transitioned away from the drug-centric comedy that characterized his earlier work. Instead, he embraced new opportunities and roles that showcased his versatility as an actor. One notable role was that of San Francisco Special Investigator Joe Dominguez in the popular CBS police drama Nash Bridges. Through this series, a fresh audience was introduced to Cheech, recognizing him not as the perpetually intoxicated Pedro from his past works, but as a skilled and serious character. Additionally, Cheech became a recognizable face in the films of director Robert Rodriguez, appearing in action-packed movies as well as family-friendly comedies, appealing to audiences of all ages, the divergent paths. As Cheech Marine embarked on a journey to become a well-known mainstream actor, his partner Tommy Chong took a different path, returning to the spotlight as a solo stand-up comedian. Chong leaned into his reputation as a beloved figure associated with marijuana culture, showcasing his comedic chops in the 1990 films Far Out Man. Throughout the 1990s, Chong kept a relatively low profile, but he made a triumphant return to the public eye in 1999 with his portrayal of the aging hippie Leo on the popular TV show That 70s Show. However, Chong's resurgence was short-lived. In 2003, trouble struck when Chong Glass Nice Dreams, a company he had founded with his son Paris, became entangled in legal issues related to the sale of drug paraphernalia. In an attempt to protect his family from legal consequences, Chong negotiated a plea deal with his lawyers. This deal required him to admit to one count of conspiracy to distribute drug paraphernalia, ultimately aiming to keep his son and wife out of jail. Even though Tommy Chong tried hard, he couldn't convince the court to let him serve the community or be confined to his house instead of going to prison. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reported that he got sentenced to nine months behind bars. What's interesting is that out of all the 55 people charged, Chong was the only one without any previous criminal record who had to go to jail. Cheech Marine's journey after his famous duo, Cheech and Chong. It's kind of funny how he transitioned from being known for adult humor and marijuana culture to becoming a big name in children's entertainment. Starting in 1988, he became involved with Disney animation by lending his voice to Tito the Chihuahua in Oliver and Company. From there, he voiced characters like Banzai the Hyena in The Lion King and Ramon the Lowrider in the Cars movies. But the most surprising turn came in 1992 when Marin released his first album for kids, called My Name is Cheech, The School Bus Driver. In this album, Cheech plays a friendly bus driver who teaches kids about different subjects like math and making friends. It's quite a shift from his earlier comedy, but shows his versatility and talent in entertaining audiences of all ages. In 1997, Cheech, the friendly school bus driver, came back with an exciting new story for kids called My Name is Cheech, the school bus driver coast to coast. This time, Cheech embarked on a musical journey filled with adventures. After yeah. that, his adventures continued in a bunch of fun children's books published by HarperCollins. Then, starting in 2001, Cheech took on a cool role as Agent Felix Gum in Robert Rodriguez's action comedy movie, Spy Kids. This role made Cheech even more popular among young viewers. Back in 2012, during an interview with CNN's Don Lemon, Tommy Chong bravely revealed that he was fighting prostate cancer. Chong has always been a big supporter of marijuana legalization and its medicinal properties. So, when he faced his diagnosis, he turned to cannabis for his treatment. He shared, 
I have prostate cancer, and I'm using hemp oil and cannabis to treat it. For him, the legalization of marijuana wasn't just about recreational use. It was personal. It was about his health. Then, less than a year after his announcement, Chong shared some fantastic news on CelebStoner.com. He proudly declared that he had beaten cancer with a mixture of hash oil and supplements. It was a triumphant moment for him. But life threw him another curveball in 2015. He revealed that while his prostate cancer was in remission, he was now battling rectal cancer. Despite the setback, Chong didn't lose his sense of humor. He joked about it being a pain in the butt and shared with us weekly, I'm using cannabis like crazy now, more than ever before. He was determined to face this new challenge head on. He understood that his treatment might or might not work, but he was determined to stay positive. For Tommy Chong, it was all about staying strong, finding humor in tough times, and of course finding comfort in his beloved cannabis, the duo's reunion. After their dramatic split in the 1980s, the dynamic duo went their separate ways for many years. Then, in 1992, they finally reunited, joining forces to lend their voices to characters in the animated movie Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest. Their collaboration continued to spark interest when, in 1997, Chong appeared on Marine's TV show Nash Bridges in an episode titled Wild Card. This episode cleverly nodded to their famous Dave skit from their 1972 debut album, adding an extra layer of nostalgia for fans. Their partnership took on a new dimension in the year 2000, when both stars contributed their voices to an episode of the popular animated series South Park, titled Cherokee Hair Tampons. Despite their joint effort, their recordings were done separately. The year 2003 brought a glimmer of hope for fans longing to see them together again, as both Marin and Chong expressed their willingness to reunite during an episode of Biography. Well, I just realized the time. We've been over half an hour. Um, if you hung out this far, thanks, mates. Um, yeah, it's AI. It's Cheech Marin, not Cheech Marine AI. Karaki. And that's Cheech and Chong. God bless you. And we're going to finish off with Three Little Pigs off the wedding album. Remember this one? <laughs> this is great. Big love, mates. Wishing you well. Big love. Okay, Jupiter, go turn out the light. Okay, now, you guys, this is going to be a real scary story. So if anybody got a heart condition, they better cover their ears. All right, now, everybody be quiet and no crying. Because this is a real scary story that my grandfather told me right before he died. Once upon a time, there was three little pigs. And no, no, wait a minute. Now, this is about three other little pigs. This is about three real bad little pigs who used to mess up the house all the time. And they'd leave all their clothes laying all over and their, their toys on the stairs. And they used to run around the house all day and yell and scream and never shut up and, or blow their nose or nothing. And the worst thing, they used to never lift up the toilet seat. And this made their mother real mad. So one day, the mother says to the father, I'm sick up and fed with these three little pigs. All they do all day is run around the house and make noise, and they never clean up their room or blow their nose. And the worst thing, I'm getting sticky buns. And the father said, yeah, I know. And I'm sick up and fed with those three little pigs too. So I got an idea. Tomorrow, when the three little pigs go to school, let's move. So early the next morning, the father got up and went down and rented a U-Haul trailer. And then he came back and stopped by the supermarket and picked up a whole bunch of cardboard boxes and brought them all home. And they packed everything in the whole house, except for the ring around the bathtub. And then they moved right across the street to her mother's house. Because they knew the three little pigs would never find them there because they weren't allowed to cross the street by themselves. So that afternoon, when the three little pigs came home from school, they went into the house to turn on the TV to watch cartoons. And the first thing they noticed was there was no cartoons and no TV to watch them on. And they looked around the house and they said, Hey, I think somebody moved. 
and the second little pig said, yeah, I think it was our parents. And the third little pig said, well, where are we going to watch cartoons? Then, all of a sudden, there came a big knock on the door. Boom, boom, boom. So the three little pigs ran over to the window to see who it was, and they saw that it was the landlord. So the first little pig, remembering what his father told him to say when the landlord came around, yelled out, there's nobody home. And the landlord didn't believe that, so he knocked on the door again. Boom, boom, boom. So the second little pig said, the check's in the mail. And the landlord still didn't believe that either, and he knocked on the door again. Boom, boom, boom. And then the third little pig said, Hey, landlord, can we come over your house and watch cartoons? And that made the landlord really mad, because he hated cartoons, especially the Flintstones. So the landlord banged on the door again and said, Hey, you pigs, you let me in. And the first little pig said, Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. And the landlord went nuts, and he kicked the door in, and he walked in and he said, Okay, which one you was the poet? And the first little pig said, Oh, you like that? I got a million of them. And the landlord said, I'll show you how much I like that. And he grabbed the little pig and he ate them all up. And then he grabbed the second little pig and ate him all up too. And the third little pig said, Gee, he must be mad. I never saw him do that before. I better think of something while I stall for time. And he asked the landlord, Hey, landlord, uh, do you want a bromo sauce or something? And the landlord just let out a big burp and kept coming towards the third little pig. So the third little pig said, gee, this calls for desperate action. So he reached down and he took off his chew and he held it up to the landlord's face. And the landlord took one whiff and his eyes bugged out like a Volkswagen and they started watering and he fell down on his knees and started choking. Then the little pig did something he never did before in his life. He took off his sock and he stuck it in the landlord's mouth. And the landlord started gagging and choking and crying and speeding up. And he fell over and he kicked his legs three times in the air and fell over dead. So the moral of the story is, always walk softly but carry a big stink. How do you like that one? Pretty good story, huh? <laughs> hey, what are you kids doing? Hey, you put your shoes back on. Come on, you little motherfucker. Put your shoes back on. Don't take off your socks. Come on. Hey, hey, hey. Help! Help! Hey, come on, you little... Get away from me. Help! 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 Who is it? It's me, Dave. Open up, man. I got the stuff. Who is it? It's me, Dave, man. Open up, I got the stuff. I Who? It's Dave, man. Open up, I think the cops saw me come in here. Who is it? It's, it's Dave, man. Will you open up? I got the stuff with me. Who? Dave, man, open up. Dave? Yeah, Dave, come on, man. Open up, I think the cops Dave's saw me. Dave's not here. No, man, I'm Dave, man. Hey, come on, man. Who is it? It's Dave, man. Will you open up? I got the stuff with Who? me. Dave, man, open up. Dave? Yeah, Dave. Dave's not here. No, man, I am Dave, man. Will you, come on, open up the door, will you? I got the stuff with me. I think the cops saw me. Who is it? Oh, what the hell is it? Go, man, open up the door. It's Dave. Who? Dave, D-A-V-E. Will you open up the goddamn Dave? door? Yeah, Dave. Dave! Right, man, Dave. Now, will you open up the door? Dave's not here! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Crikey. Big love, mate. If you made it this far, you're a legend. God bless you. Yeah, it was a bit of a haul free some of it, but I had fun making it. Big love, legends. Wishing you well. Peace.